Hi, I'm Sean Kelly, the voice of the Gators, and welcome to episode number 29 of the Gator Tales podcast with Sean Kelly. Greetings from inside my office here at the Swamp, putting together this episode of the podcast today, and then I'll finish packing up for a road trip. It's off to Columbia, Missouri. Gators baseball takes on the Missouri Tigers on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this coming weekend. We'll be away, but campus will be busy, to say the least. Softball is home. They've got a massive series against the LSU Tigers. Gators Gymnastics is hosting NCAA regional competition this weekend inside the O-Dome. The Final Four is this weekend in men's college basketball, so that world is gathering in Phoenix, Arizona. And this week, we've got big congratulations all across the board. How about men's swimming and diving and Gators women's swimming and diving? Each finishing in the top five of the NCAAs. Track and field had a big weekend at home this past week, garnering all kinds of high marks in the Pepsi relays. Softball's on a roll, and the Gators baseball team, the one I'll be leaving with later today, is 6-3 and three in conference play now and finds itself in second place in its division. With regard to baseball, let's get to our guest today. B.T. Ryapel is a part of this Gator Tales with Sean Kelly podcast. The former Gator player is still involved with the baseball program. Of course, Ryapel, a fan fra- favorite and a leader of last year's team that won the SEC and finished as the national runner-up. His playing career is done. He decided not to play pro ball. He has a professional life in the financial world, and he's back and with the program in a unique way. B.T. Ryapel is spending part of this season as a new analyst on the SEC Plus television broadcasts of Gators Baseball. We'll talk about B.T. Ryapel's broadcast career, it's a budding one, and his post-playing life, and how he's so excited to be back in Gainesville for select weekends this year during the baseball season. And then we have to talk about Gators football. Not much farther to go with regard to the spring football practice session. In fact, one week from this coming Saturday, April the 13th, is the Orange and Blue spring game. It's part of a huge Orange and Blue weekend that we'll talk with Athletic Director Scott Strickland about in just a moment. But meanwhile, with regard to football, after one scrimmage last weekend and another coming this weekend, we're starting to see improvements with the team heading for the 2024 season. One of the big impact guys on defense is going to be Kelby Collins, an edge rusher who now finds himself also playing inside at defensive tackle at times. He's working under a new coach. There's a new structure altogether for the Gators defense, and Collins now, in his second year, is eager to tell us all about his progress and that of his teammates. Back to Athletic Director Scott Strickland and the upcoming Orange and Blue weekend. This week on Ask the AD, we talked to Strickland about the big weekend on campus and what it means for our teams in competition and for you, the fans. And finally, all those big results to share with you over the last 7 to 10 days. Our student worker, Kenna McGinnis, is back with another edition of Kenna on Campus. With that, let's get started. We'll go to the football field first and get to know Kelby Collins. Gator Tales with Sean Kelly is presented by UF Health. UF Health has locations throughout Florida, including Gainesville, Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Leesburg, and the Villages, and we're growing. Compassionate care and world-class outcomes, that's our game plan. Visit ufhealth.org to learn more. Our podcast is also brought to you by Pet Paradise. Gator fans, for pet fanatics like you, there's only one place who goes all out for your pet the way you do. Boarding, grooming, day camp, and veterinary services, all in one convenient location. Pet Paradise and New Day Veterinary Care. Finally, complete pet health care is here for Gator Nation. Fresh off the practice field. I mean, that's literally what this is. Kelby Collins is our guest. You guys just wrapped up another spring football practice. First of all, I appreciate you having some time to visit as you just did not only a full practice, but conditioning too. How are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling good. Um, just glad to be out here, you know, participating in this practice with, with my teammates. Um, just feel great to be back out here, really. What's the difference between spring football practice and, say, whether it be August or during the fall? I um, feel like it's a lot more intense um, right about now. You know, we've got guys battling for spots. 
Um, guys trying to prove themselves out here. Um, you know, freshmen trying to prove themselves, like I said. But mm-hmm. it's just, everything's just more intense, more detailed. We're trying to, you know, install the playbook and stuff like that. So everything's more precise. You have a new defensive line coach, and um, you still have Mike be around as well. Give me your thoughts on how that's working so far. Uh, it's working good. Um, love Coach Chapman. Love the energy he brings. Um, you know, he holds us a very high standard. And um, same thing with uh, Coach Mike P. You know, I still talk to him. I'm still my guy. Um, he holds me to a high standard, too. So just having them two, you know, hold me to a high standard and our groups, uh, respectively, um, to a high standard, I feel like um, – that's that's something that we need yeah what's different about this defense you think than what we saw in the fall uh, i think we got a lot more experience a lot more guys that's um you know that's coming into play um we have depth at different positions um that can bring you know different things to the table per se um you know like in different packages and stuff like that so i think our defense as a whole is more versatile a little bit more experience, and um, everybody's just ready to play, really. And big. You yeah, guys are big, big up yeah. front, aren't you? Yes, sir. We, that includes you. I, I know they list you as an edge guy, but mm-hmm. I've seen you line up in the middle, too, as a D tackle. Which which one are you? Are you both? Um, right now I'm defense end, but you know, it's just spring, so it really can really can uh, fluctuate. But I can you know go out here and play any position they need me to up, up on the front. Yeah. Which one would you like to play at the next level? Have you even thought about that? Uh, I really haven't really thought about that as much right now. I'm just really trying to, you know, focus on whatever I can to do to help the team get better. Yep. As far as leadership goes on the side of the ball now, we've got some new pieces that have come in. We've got some linebackers that mm-hmm. obviously got a lot of snaps underneath them. And, and I thought you got a lot of mm-hmm. time on task as well last year. What's the leadership like, or do you, do you find yourself in that mix? Uh, yeah, I, I consider myself a leader. I think my teammates consider me a leader as well. But on that side of the ball, like I said, we got we got guys that have a ton of experience that are coming in instantly being leaders. Like, everybody has to lead to be a good defense, I feel like, and that's something that we're taking serious. And that's something that the coaches have made a priority that we need to talk, we need to lead, you know, lead the young guys so they, be re- so they can be ready, you know, to back us up if we need the help um, come game time. Are you a serious guy, or do you like to have fun, or both? Uh, both. Uh, I like to have fun, but you know, when it's time to get serious, I get serious. Who's that? Where's Where's that come from? Is that somebody in your family, somebody that coached you before you came here? Where does the serious side of Kelby Collins come from? Um, previous coaches, uh, my uncle, my mom. Really, they're like my mom's really the most my kind of more serious than my dad. So, I guess that comes from her and uh, her side of the family. Tell me more about mom. Did she play sports when she was coming up? Uh, do you have brothers and sisters that have now tried to follow as well as far as a sporting life? Yeah, so my mom played, um, she did, I think she ran, she played basketball. Wow. Um, and she also was on the um, um, dance team. My dad played basketball for New Mexico State. Um, my uncle played basketball for uh, uh, Tuskegee. Um, I have two two sisters one of them played basketball for Cal State uh, Bakersfield and my younger brother he's at Arkansas State right now so his freshman year how did you not play basketball I played basketball as well I played we all played uh, football and basketball me and my brother played yeah. football and basketball growing up was it a hard decision to focus on football and not basketball with all that going on in your family uh not really I really I, I knew I wanted to play football I really um just enjoy like yep. hitting people so that's really why so, so i'm sorry say that again you enjoy what hitting people <laughs> this is the legal way to do it isn't it yeah it is a contact sport even though we don't do it as much i would say non-game days is it hard to keep it a contact sport when it is not practiced as much for player safety concern uh yeah i think i think it is a little bit but um i think the coaches do a good job of enforcing you know not um, tackling, not bringing them down to the ground and practice and stuff like that. So, I mean, but when it's time to go, you know, we flip that switch like it's like we've been doing it all year. Yeah, I thought so in the first scrimmage. It looked like this was going to be a good tackling team. It mm-hmm. looked really good this past Saturday. Yeah. Kelby, you grew up in Alabama, right? Mm-hmm. What town again? Um, Grandel. Yep. Tell me about growing up there. Is that small town America? What would you describe it as? Uh, it's not small, but it's not too big. It's pretty decent town. Um, you know, 15 minutes from Birmingham. Oh, okay. Um, so growing up there, it was, it was pretty cool, you know. Um, 
you know, a lot of my friends still back there. A lot of us, you know, playing college ball right now. So um, I'm glad of that. And I mean, just life in Grand. It was it was cool. Yeah. If if mom were to come and visit or you go home, what's the first meal you want to have with regard that would tie you back to your home? Um, that's a hard one. Mm. Really, whatever grandma cooks. Oh, really grandma's the, yeah. the she's the one, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she she do the cooking. So okay. Whatever she cook, I'm eat. You're like six what six five two seventy two seventy five. That's mm-hmm. a lot of food to fill a man. Yeah, it is. But she do a good job at it. Though. <laughs> she do a good job at it. When you're not playing football, you're doing what? Um, when I'm not playing football, I'm either playing the game, um, or playing with my dog. What do you think your teammates don't know about you? Maybe yet. Um, is there a hidden to, talent or a passion that you've got? I know how to cook. I think I think some of my teammates that live with me they know that, but not a lot of people know that. So uh, if I'm coming over, what do you? What's the specialty of the house? Uh, I probably made some pasta, some like Cajun pasta, or something like that. You're re- you're you're singing my song, my yeah. man. I appreciate that, Kelby. When when we have another conversation, let's say in September, mm-hmm. how different will the conversation be from the one that we're having now for you personally and for your teammates? Uh, I think it'll be pretty different. I think by then I'll um, have adjusted to my new position a little bit more, um, have a little bit more experience out here. And as far as the team, just us getting closer as a team, you know, a lot of new pieces came in. But just as far as us getting closer, I feel like the conversation will be a little bit different. I think a lot of fans ask me this, and we'll end on this too. Just five wins last year, mm-hmm. there is an inevitable bad taste in the mouth, right, yep. after a season like that. Have you guys flushed that and are on to bigger and better things, or does a season like that last year fuel you now in preparation for this next season? I think a little bit of both. It definitely fuels us a lot. Um, you know, looking back at that record, you know, we, we hate that. But really, you got to put that to bed and, and move on to the next season and, and try to improve in any way you can. And I think that's something that we're doing good of, you know, in our position room, you know, we're not going for, we're not, we don't want that anymore. Like, you know, we're going to do everything that we can and push the guys, offense included, do everything they can to, to help us, you know, get over the hump. Kelby, I'm grateful for you and our visit. Keep up the good work. Go Gators. Go Gators. Well, if you go to Condren Ballpark, you can still find BT Riopel jerseys roaming around. They're in the stands. You can still find BT Riopel at Condren Ballpark, just not in the dugout or on the field. He's now in the broadcast booth, and he's in his first season now as a broadcaster on the SEC Plus broadcast from Florida Gators Baseball. How does that sound, BT Riopel, to you as just this being months removed from your playing career? Yeah, well, it's still kind of fresh in my mind, but it is surreal. I mean, you know, thinking that, you know, going into a baseball season, I feel as if I should still be playing. Um, But obviously, you know, you said one year removed. It's not something I've ever thought about, um, but knew I wanted to stay around the game in some way or another. And, you know, you talked about the opportunity coming up this year and it presented itself and what a what a cool way to stay involved with the program as an ambassador for the program. And, you know, just to give a little bit of my insight from uh, my previous year's experiences as, as playing for a, for the Gators baseball team. Bradley, I feel like it was about a year ago at this time that I kind of first floated the idea your way. And I wasn't surprised that you didn't play it off, but you kind of just were focused on what you were doing at the moment. Um, did you think about it after I brought it up and, and what made you make the decision to do it? Well, funny enough, we we won that game after you asked me and I didn't think about it during the game, but I went home and obviously pretty happy since we won. It gives you the ability to think about other things other than a loss. So uh, I actually talked to my dad about it after and I was like, you know, Sean came up to me and asked me if I wanted to announce next year. And he's like, well, what'd you tell him? And I was like, well, I told him I had to go win a game here in 30 minutes. So I couldn't talk about it too much, but um no, it was it was a great opportunity. I was super excited when you asked me. Um, like I said, nothing I've really thought about doing before. Um, but you know what a what a great opportunity for me, and, and super excited to be doing it. So, what are you learning about being a broadcaster, and how does your playing experience help you as a broadcaster now? Yeah, well, my playing mm-hmm. playing experience gives a lot of insight to people um, that you know maybe the I don't want to say the average person, but just an, a person that necessarily hasn't necessarily played at the level that I've been at before and, and learned in depth, 
uh, things about the game that you would only learn if you were um, ex- or, uh, exposed to that experience, uh, so to say. So that's something that I can bring to the table. Um, but I have learned that I can't say everything that I think all the time because sometimes I, I wanted to say something, but you can't. Um, but, you know, it's a different view of the game. I mean, you're not involved at, in it you know, in the game itself, but you try to think about it the same way as if you were playing to, uh, um, to give everybody that insight. Cause that's really why I'm there. So, but you know, it's been great learning from both you and Nick and everybody else that I've really listened to now, um, since I've been in this role. You mentioned Nick, Nick Belmonte. And one of the, the enjoyable things that I've uh, experienced through broadcasting with the two of you is that you both represent two different eras of Gators baseball. And I think that's tied together a couple of different generations. How different is the generational play that Nick went through to what you and your teammates went through the last couple of years? Yeah, I think it's I think it's very different. And I, you know, I haven't really been exposed to many um, players that have played in that generation, like I am with Nick now, and getting to really pick his mind as much as I, you know, as much as I do being up there with him um, and get to hear it, you know, firsthand. But the game really has changed a whole lot. I know I say it all the time. The game's changed a lot in the five years since I was in college, but it really has changed over the last couple of decades. Um, just the way things are thought about and, you know, mentalities and demeanors of players, uh, how they approach the game, how they, you know, um, prepare themselves in preparation before games and weekend series, um, you know, and the style of player is different now too. The, and the style of play is different. So there's so many different aspects of the game that have changed, but it's great to have, you know, two different generations of players. Obviously when Jeff Cardozo is up there as well, that's a third generation as well. So it's a pretty cool dynamic we have up there. It really is. Um, and, of course, you played for Kevin O'Sullivan, the current Florida Gators head coach. Take the curtain back a little bit, if you don't mind, BT. Give us, uh, the fans, an idea of what it's like to play for him. I, I was asked that question a few days ago, and I'm, I'm asked it a lot, actually. Um, you know, I've always thought it's very easy. Um, you know, before coming into Florida, you hear a lot of things about Sully, how he's a very hard guy to play for, and he's very hard on you. Um, but you know, I've never shied away from that. And I really tried to keep my mind open, um, to him before I came in to get my own experience. Um, so when I came in, if you're a guy that works hard, if you care about the game, if you're a student of the game, if you're willing to put your body on the line and your mind on the line and and your well being on the line to win games for that program and, you know, set aside your ego and, and your personal benefit from the game and really focus on the entire team and wrap yourself around the team and the program. He's the easiest person to play for in the whole world because that's the type of guys he wants to have in the program. Those are the type of guys that will lead and be successful within this program. Um, And, you know, the people that don't necessarily either have a great relationship with him or, um, you know, didn't like playing for him. I I don't think those are the type of players that were successful. And if you look at the guys that have been successful and are those people that wrap themselves around the program and and truly care about their teammates and, you know, things outside of just themselves, I think, they do have a pretty good relationship with Sully, and they respect him a lot more. Well said. Tim McCarver was one of the great baseball television analysts of all time, and he was a catcher. Why are catchers so good at analyzing the game, especially in a broadcast? Well, I, you know, much like a quarterback in football, um, they do have to understand everything that's going on at all times. Um, the game has shifted in a way where catchers don't necessarily call games anymore. It's a very rare thing um, at the collegiate level anyway and professional baseball pitchers like to call their own game i mean catchers call the pitch but pitchers have the ability to shake off and call whatever they want so the game has changed that way um but i still like to approach it as a student of the game you really try to learn the other team's weaknesses and how to exploit them while you know continuously trying to um put your pitcher or your defense or your entire team in the best position possible um to play towards their strengths um and be successful that way so catchers really have to do those things but also have the mental capacity and mental strength and fortitude to be able to put aside their failures, um, maybe in the box um, when they're hitting and really focus on the defense when they go back out there, because if they fault in any way, the team faults and they don't perform as well as they should. So um, to have that physical ability, the mental capacity and um, that attitude and the leadership qualities that they need, that's what, that's what it takes to be a catcher. And I think, you know, it's, it's great that I can, use that knowledge and experience that I've had with that into and into the booth when I'm up there. And sometimes you have to be critical um, in an objective way, obviously. Here in your first year as a broadcaster, BT, you're analyzing 
some of your former teammates. I'd be curious if, as if, do you find that to be easier to be critical of them when the time is right, or does it make it harder? Uh, you know, it's it's a little bit of both. Um, I love the guys I played with. They're all my best friends. Um, but I think they are my best friends because they understand how much I care about them. And they respected me, not just because I walked in and was like this, just this person, but I feel like I've, I've earned their respect because I've really gone out of my way to make sure that they are appreciated and, you know, patted on the back when they do something good, but also, um, allow them to understand that I do un- I do know the game very well. I love the game and that when I'm critiquing them, it's not because I'm critiquing them because I don't like them. Um, I'm, I'm only doing it for the benefit of the team and the team itself. And if they are better, the team is better. Um, and they respect me for that. And I wasn't afraid to jump them and, and get on them and critique them because I critique them just as much or if not a little bit less than I critique myself. I was very hard on myself as a player. Um, so I'm not, you know, a, a hypocritical person, I, I don't think. And I don't think they would say that either. Um, so they respected me. So it's easy for me to critique them. It's not as hard as you would think. Maybe for somebody else it might be, but um, not a, not as much for me. Yeah, but let's just be clear here. It's different than being critical of them in the dugout in the clubhouse, you're doing it now in a very public way, you know, on television. Right. Absolutely. So maybe that part's a little, a little bit different. Everything's true. One of your former teammates has made his way to the major leagues. Wyatt Langford is now up with the Texas Rangers. He will be in your town, Tampa this week as the Rangers take on the race. A, will you go see him play? And B, what do you think of his very, very fast Ascent. Yeah, well, when he found out uh, that he was going to make the big league team and made the roster, I immediately, uh, I was fortunate enough to work for a company uh, that has a suite at Tropicana Field in Tampa or in St. Petersburg and immediately booked that suite for the night whenever the Rangers came to play. So I'm actually going tonight to see him uh, and made sure I found my way and finagled my way down the field. So I have uh, passes on the sideline or on the field uh, for pregame to be able to, you know, give him a hug and tell him how much I care about him and so proud of him. Um, but, you know, he is the most deserving guy for this, not only for, you know, his character and, and his background and who he is as a person, but, you know, he's the ultimate professional. He prepares in the right way. Um, you know, he plays the game the right way. He plays exceptionally hard, which is, you know, sometimes hard to find nowadays. He's not a a me guy he'll never showboat and tell you about himself um so everything that he's gotten right now and what he'll get in the future he most definitely deserves that's awesome let's talk about this team just for a moment if you don't mind uh you and i are fresh off of seeing jack caglione hit a walk-off home run uh to win a series against mississippi state and here the gators are six and three in sec play they've won three series in the league against three ranked teams Yet we're 27 games in, BT Riopelle, and I think there's a lot of fans and maybe even those of us in the Florida baseball family that still have questions about who this team really is and, and what they have in front of them. What are your takeaways now through these first 27 games? Where is this going? You know, this is a lot of what I expected. Um, there were going to be some pains. I mean, you look at the RPI and strength of schedule right now. The Gators have the, num- the hardest and the number one ranked strength of schedule, the hardest schedule in the entire country. Um, so that's not for a team that has been built with a bunch of old guys and experienced guys and players that have been places that others haven't, you know, this is a very young team. And even the guys that are older on paper, haven't had the experience that, you know, maybe some previous Florida players that have, that have had before. Um, the most, one of the most experienced guys on the pitching staff is Jack Caglione. He's only thrown one entire season in in his career. This is his second year now. Cade Fisher, another guy, this is his second year now. Brandon Neely, one of the other guys, this is his third year. Um, so when you look at that, and one thing one thing that sticks out in my mind is when, you know, this previous weekend I talked to Ron Polk and he looked at me and said, you guys have 11 freshman arms on your team. I've never seen a successful team in the SEC have 11 freshman arms on their team and rely on 10 of them in the, in the year so far in nine in SEC play. And pitching a defense wins baseball games. So, The fact that they've had some struggles to start out with doesn't surprise me. Um, But you will see them as time goes on. You move past that, you know, halfway mark. You move towards the end of the SEC playing into the postseason potentially. You'll see them grow up a little bit. You'll see a little bit more swagger. You'll see a little bit better stuff on the mound because they have that confidence surrounding them. Um, And the bats will come along too. I I thoroughly believe in that hot, cold, hot method where – you know, you start out hot, you have a little bit of a cold stretch, and then you finish out strong playing your best baseball. So – 
you know, this, this team doesn't surprise me this year. Um, you know, hopefully it goes the way they want to towards the end of the year, but I definitely know they're putting in the work towards that. Yeah. Uh, before I get to my last question, I, you know, this, this broadcasting thing we're talking about, BT is not your full-time job. Your, your, your post-playing career is share with the fans what you do on a full-time basis. Yes. So a lot of people think I'm a financial advisor. I am, I am not a financial advisor. I work for a large asset manager down in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. It's a global company for that is Franklin Templeton Investments. Um, I'm a part of their ETF, which is an, ex- is an exchange traded fund, much like a mutual fund, a little bit more transparent, cost efficient liquid vehicle um, to invest in. Um, so I'm a part of their sales group that sells our investment products to financial advisors to put on their platform for their individual investors to invest in. Um, so that's pretty much what I'm doing right now on an everyday basis. Uh, thoroughly enjoy my job right now. It gives me the opportunity to, to be up there with you guys on the weekend and uh, stay a part of this program. Yeah, we're extremely grateful for that. Last thing is this, Bradley Ryapel. Um, I got used to hearing Miley Cyrus party in the USA about yeah. three to four times a night whenever the Gators were at home. That was your walk-up song. We know the story behind it. I'm curious, when was the last time you listened to that song? So every time I get in the car with uh, my fiance's uh, dad, so my future father-in-law, uh, he likes to listen to that song just to like, remind him of the baseball games and stuff like that um, on the way to the games because – you know, I guess it affected a lot more people than I thought. You know, um, it was great to see so many people be a part of the last two years when I was there um, and enjoy it as much as I did. Um, but yeah, people try not to live it down. I mean, they they keep it around and whatnot, but I haven't listened to it that much personally. I, uh, I'm glad that you answered. That's a great way uh, to answer that. It means that you're still hearing it because I think all of us still hear it in our head, even yeah. though we don't hear it at the ballpark on a regular basis anymore. That's right. Enjoy the game uh, with your teammate, Wyatt Langford, and we'll see you back at the ballpark soon. Great visit, BT. Appreciate you as always. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Sean. I appreciate it. Time now to visit with Director of Athletics, Scott Strickland. Time for Ask the AD. As we turn the page here into April, it is a busy month for the Gators and their fans. And Scott, right in the middle of the month here is the Orange and Blue Weekend. It's an old concept that kind of comes back in a new way this year. And I've had a lot of folks asking, how are we going to manage this and enjoy what is really a Gators festival the entire weekend long? Well, no question, Sean, that... Uh, the orange and blue game becomes a tentpole for a really uh, exciting weekend for for people who love the orange and blue, right? And you'll have a three-game baseball series against South Carolina. Uh, women's tennis has a match uh, against South Carolina that Saturday. Lacrosse is is in town competing against James Madison. Uh, track and field hosts their last home meet of the regular season, the Tom Jones uh, Invitational, and um, and then of course. Uh, the orange and blue game at one o'clock on on the thirteenth on that Saturday, um, uh, and and then leads into Saturday. We have more baseball, men's tennis is competing, and there, there's a lot to to look forward to. So it's a, um, you know, it's it's going to be a beehive of activity, and certainly uh, uh, give Gator fans a chance to kind of uh, uh, come and enjoy the the football game, which is free of charge, but then sample some of these other sporting events, some of which they may be familiar with, but uh, maybe get a few Gator fans exposed to some other great things that happen with our sports teams. Was that the plan all along? Take the spring game, which had been on Thursday nights the last couple of years, move it back into this deal to where you could literally spend all day on campus hitting these different venues. Yeah, you know, traditionally this is when we would have had it. Uh, uh, the last year, last couple of years were a bit of an anomaly, the way the schedule fell with some other things. But um, uh, it, it certainly makes a lot of sense when you can put it down in the middle of a weekend where you already have, these, as you know, Sean, these spring weekends, um, are a lot of fun on, on in a place like Gainesville, right, where you do have all these sports going on simultaneously and you're keeping up with all of it. You're trying to uh, hit as many as possible. And, um, you know, to put the spring game on top of that and, and all the festivities that go along with it um, really makes it a, a super Gator weekend. There'll be details, of course, at FloridaGators.com. Is there anything else that you would like to message to the fans with regard to navigating that long Saturday? No, you know, it's uh, it's not quite like a fall football game from a traffic standpoint, but it certainly is uh, an enhanced 
uh, number of people that are going to be visiting this beautiful campus here at the University of Florida. And so we just ask people to plan ahead. Uh, go to floridagators.com, as you reference. Um, if you have not done so uh, and you care about going to the baseball game or some of these other ticketed events, uh, we encourage you to contact the ticket office as soon as possible and, and make your plans to join us. Saturday, April 13th. Scott, thanks as always. Go Gators. Go Gators. And now for our last order of business. With all the results from the Gators over the past week and a half, once again, here's Kenna McGinnis with Kenna on campus. Thanks, Sean. Our recap begins with number six Gators baseball, who had a packed schedule at home this past week. Florida added a series victory to their record this weekend against 21st-ranked Mississippi State, with walk-off wins on Friday 7-6 and Sunday 4-3, and a loss on Saturday 12-2. In Tuesday's matchup against Florida A&M, the Gators bested the Rattlers with a final score of 10-7. The Gators delivered five home runs, two of which are from Brody Dene. Dene's slams are his first as a Gator, and I was able to capture his thoughts after the game. It felt really good, you know, just trying to go up to the plate and doing what I can and knowing I could do something like that was really awesome. And, you know, the biggest thing about it was I just, it's going to help me get rolling. Because knowing what I can do mentally has really helped. And just my mental state has been a lot better in the box. 10th ranked Florida softball also pulled out a series win away against 17th ranked Mississippi State last weekend. The scores read 13 to 12 Bulldogs on Friday, 8 to 5 Gators on Saturday, and 7 to 6 Gators on Sunday. Last Saturday marked history for Gator Swim and Dive. The men's team rallied together to finish third in the nation at the 2024 NCAA Championships for the 11th third place finish in program history. Florida's men's and women's programs have not finished in the top three together for 37 years, but Saturday's team effort broke that streak. Florida is also the only swimming and diving program in the country to have both teams finish in the top five at this year's NCAAs. The Florida women's golf team wrapped up their regular season in Athens at the Liz Murphy Collegiate Classic on Saturday. Both the Gators and Inez Archer finished runner-up at the finale. Overall for the season, the team finished top seven in all nine tournaments with three victories, seven top five, and six top three finishes. The Gators look forward to postseason play at the SEC Championship in the coming weeks. Gators lacrosse remains undefeated in conference play after their matchup against Vanderbilt in Nashville last weekend. For the first time of the season, Florida did not score first, but still beat the Commodores 20-5. Number 14 women's tennis cranked out two wins in SEC play last weekend. The Gators won over Mississippi State on Friday, 4-0, and 30th ranked Ole Miss on Sunday, 4-3. Away in Athens, the men's team collected their first road win of the season. Number 32 Florida bested number 34 Georgia on Sunday, 4-2. Lastly, Florida Track and Field hosted the 2024 Pepsi Florida Relays this past weekend here in Gainesville. Results from the finale left the Gators with 23 total top 10 finishes, 5 University of Florida all-time top 10 finishes, and 17 personal records. Grace Stark put on quite the show, placing first in the women's 100-meter hurdle and acquiring an Olympic qualifying mark for 2024. More Gator sports scores and recaps to come in next week's episode. That's all for now for Kenna on Campus. I'm Kenna McGinnis. Thank you, Kenneth, and of course, congratulations again to all of our winners over the past week. That'll do it for our podcast, episode number 29, In the Books. Big thanks to B.T. Ryapil, Kelby Collins, Kenneth McGinnis, and of course, Director of Athletics, Scott Strickland. Hoping for a great weekend for the Gators on the softball diamond, track and field, of course, baseball in Columbia, Missouri, and gymnastics here in NCAA regional play. We'll look forward to being back with you in this format next week. Otherwise, I'll see you on the radio. And don't forget to patronize our sponsors, UF Health and Pet Paradise. They're a big part of what we do here at the UAA. Until next time, I'm Sean Kelly, and as always, go Gators!